Hello everyone, it's lovely to see you all. Um, just before, we, um, before I begin my message, um, we do have um, the opportunity to have an intercessory prayer for Australia, so um, we'd ask if Kerry would come through and um, we'll just put that to God in prayer. Before we begin, most of you will have seen this picture. It's not a, an instant in time. It's actually a composite of the last two months, Australia from the air over the last two months. And that's, uh, that's a country that's bleeding. And uh, we are going to uh, have an intercessory prayer for the nation. The next picture, thanks Bruce, if, that's too, if the previous one was too distant, imagine them coming out your front door and seeing that. It's just, uh, it's just overwhelming. And uh, we need to intercede for our country with our great God. Let's pray. Our loving, merciful, wonderful Father, thank you for who you are. And Father... Our country doesn't any longer know who you are. From the thrashing Barnaby Joyce got in the press, having mentioned that we ought to acknowledge a higher power, he didn't even say the word God, and yet they kicked him from one end of the field to the other. Because we are not, as a nation, ready to bow our heads before you in repentance and prayer. And even if our even if our Prime Minister, who is a Christian, were to dare to announce a, a, a day of prayer, a national day of prayer, it just wouldn't be worth it to him. If his political career would be over. So that's the state of the nation morally and in relation to you. The nation is not likely to come before you in supplication. And so we, Father, in this fellowship here today, need to pray for them. We certainly pray for them in terms of the suffering, but we need to pray on their behalf and help us now to be able to just lift them, lift the people who are suffering to you in prayer. Help us to put into your hands the outcome. What do we pray in a situation like this? Do we ask you to rain on the fires and put them out? That, that may well be. We're certainly inclined that way, but Father, your plan is what's important here. And we submit ourselves, and on behalf of our nation, we submit ourselves to your judgment in this matter. And may your plan for this country be played out. And in the process, we come before you simply as people who do not know what to pray, as we ought in this situation. We certainly, our hearts go out to the people who have lost loved ones. We ask for comfort and encouragement for them. We ask for strength and encouragement and comfort for the heroes and heroines that are out there fighting this thing. It's, it's incredible, Father, that the, the economy has been knocked out of the paddock. And it's just, a, we don't know how this is going to play out. But we do know that your will for Australia is eventual reconciliation with you in Jesus Christ through the power of your spirit. So Father, with all of the intensity of our brokenness, with all the intensity of our feeling for this beautiful, wonderful country of ours, we pray that your spirit will take what we don't know how to pray as we ought, would we'll just take this prayer and deliver into your presence a prayer we should have prayed and would have prayed were we not so ignorant and broken. Father, we commit this nation and its people into your hands. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you, Kerry. Okay. 
As we begin a new decade, I've been thinking about a few things that have happened to me over the last 20 plus years. It's amazing to see how much has happened in that time. Stephen and I had only been in Perth in, for one year in the year 2000. Marge and Roy came to visit and uh, welcomed in the year 2000 with champagne and a lamb roast and a visit to the South Perth foreshore. I began my journey in the optical world in the year 2000 and so that chalks up 20 years of selling glasses and talking to people and helping people with their vision. Previous to that, our family moved back to Perth in 1994. I was 17 and I had my first year in Australian school in year 12. That was not easy. I tried my hand at studying primary teaching and worked out it wasn't for me and ended up yee-hawing and boot-scooting my days away in Lone Star Steakhouse and Saloon. I turned 21 in 1997. I went back on holiday to South Africa to celebrate my birthday with family and friends. I came back to Perth having fallen in love with my childhood sweetheart Stephen and when he visited us here in Perth later that year, Stephen proposed on New Year's Eve of 97-98. I moved back to South Africa for a year and we were married in 1998. We moved back to Perth in 99 to celebrate Tam's 21st, my sister. Thinking back to my church days, I met one of my wonderful friends at Queen's Park in 1994, and that was Kathy Marshall, Kathy Bremer now. And we have been friends ever since. We both found our marriage partners overseas and imported them to Australia. One of my favorite memories with her was that we were baptized together in 1997. And that makes it 23 years this year. This week I started a trip down memory lane discovering more about baptism. I, find, I found myself reliving the time and what was happening with me. If you would like to, take a minute with the people around you to share if you have been baptised and where it was and when it was. Don't worry if you haven't been, just have a listen to the stories around you. I'll give you a minute. Um, quite a lively conversation. I've actually really enjoyed looking around at all of you, sharing that, and everyone is smiling. It's a beautiful, it's a really beautiful thing to remember and to share. We have many people here who have been baptised for many years. I think my dad was baptised in 1966, one of the first year, first baptisms here in Perth, um, along with a 
a couple of people. Poor Mohan was baptised for the second time in 1973. So I hope that means that he got a double helping of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> Nahara in 1977. Some people in freezing cold weather. Some in foreign countries. Some in private and some in public. Kathy and I got baptised together at Carrie and Anne's home in 97 when they were pastoring us here in Perth. We decided to share it with each other and it was very special. I have been looking at Jesus' baptism in Mark 3 recently and that has opened my eyes to baptism in a very refreshing way. Today I'd like to share some highlights with you and insights about baptism, our baptism and God's heart for it. First, some background. If you go back and read the lead up to Mark 3, sorry, Matthew 3, sorry, Matthew 3. Uh, if you go back and read the lead up to this passage, which is mostly set out in Luke, you will see a story of the people God used to bring his son's baptism to fruition. You see Elizabeth and Zechariah, parents to John the Baptist. You see the gift that John was to them. They were an older couple who had not had any children yet. You see the involvement of the Holy Spirit you see Mary meeting Elizabeth and how John the Baptist kicks and flips in Elizabeth's tummy. You see two delighted women who are amazed to be part of this process. And you see a man struck down with silence because he couldn't believe. Elizabeth and Mary knew each other. They were, in fact, relatives. So Jesus and John were relatives too perhaps even cousins of sort. Elizabeth, Zechariah, Mary, Joseph and John were all given a glimpse into what God was going to do. Zechariah's words are recorded in Luke, giving this beautiful prophecy. With the loving mercy of our God, a new day from heaven will shine on us. It will bring light to those who live in darkness in the fear of death. It will guide us into the way that brings peace. Through the heartfelt mercies of our God, God's sunrise will break in upon us, shining on those in the darkness, those sitting in the shadow of death, then showing us the way, one foot at a time, down the path of peace. I highly recommend going back and reading Luke 1 and reading the story that has un unfolded. It's just a beautiful story to take part in. John had a ministry of baptism, sharing the good news. John had a vision of what Jesus was going to do. He pointed the way. We read how he had the words of God's heart to share. John had a special ministry. People would come to him, they would hear his words and would be baptised. His message during this time of sharing the good, good news of God's heart is also shown when we read what he used to say. The crowd would ask, what should we do then? John answered, anyone has two, who has two shirts should share with one who has none and anyone who has food should do the same. Even tax collectors came to be baptised. Teacher, they asked, what should we do? Don't collect any more than you are required to, he told them. Then some soldiers asked him, and what should we do? He replied, don't extort money and don't accuse people falsely. Be content with your pay. I think we've heard those words echoed in Jesus' words in other stories in the Bible. Continuing, it says, 
The people were waiting expectantly and were all wondering in their hearts if John might possibly be the Messiah. Jesus answered them all, I baptize you with water, but one who is more powerful than I will come, the straps of whose sandals I am not worthy to untie. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit and fire. It sounds like John and Jesus lived two different lives. John in the wilderness, Jesus learning carpenter skills and teaching leaders in the synagogue as a teenager. But their paths finally intersect at this baptism. Let's take a look at Matthew 3, verse 13 to 17, if you'd like to look it up. In this passage, listen as we hear of Jesus, the Spirit, and the voice of God the Father, all three persons of the God who is love. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptized by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? Jesus replied, let it be so now. It is proper for us to do this for, for, to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. The passage begins with Jesus coming to John the Baptist to be baptized. This creates a challenge for John's way of thinking at first. We see this response played out in our lives and the world at large as Jesus comes to us. God is the one who takes the initiative in coming to us and we are left either resisting or accepting him. In John's case, as we can often relate, he first re resisted and then consented. Notice that in G it is Jesus who takes the initiative to come to John. John's whole ministry was characterized by preaching in the wilderness and having people come to him. Jesus, on the other hand, does not stay in Galilee waiting for John and others to come to him. He goes out. We can see a turn in how Jesus will do ministry compared to the way John the Baptist had been doing ministry. This tells us something about God's heart. God is a sending God who comes to his people where they are. He doesn't wait till we find him. He finds us in our wilderness when we are lost and walking in darkness. That didn't keep the Father from finding us and coming to us. This story gives us a glimpse into the Father's heart. He loves us and moves towards us to make himself known. The Greek word baptizo for baptize carries the meaning to dip, to immerse, or to dye, the color, dye a color. The picture is like a piece of cloth being soaked and saturated in a vat of dye. The cloth is so penetrated with what it is immersed in that it shares the same qualities. Like an immersed cloth in a vat of dye, the Trinity, the Trinity has existed for all eternity in baptism. The Father, Son and Spirit have for all eternity live, lived baptized, continually immersed, soaked and saturated with the love, joy, creativity and overflow of shared life. This baptized life of the triune God is shared with us in Jesus. This picture of to dip, to immerse or to die has been mind-blowing for me this week. I see a refreshing view on baptism and it excites me. The powerful imagery of immersion or the act of being immersed in something. I think that is clearer to me now than what my baptism was about. It is more about being immersed in the relationship with the Father, Son and Spirit 
choosing to stay, to swim, to be supported, to be refreshed. It's about choosing relationship. Let me tell you what I remember before I got baptised. I was confused at my baptism. I kept asking, am I ready? This is a big, this is a big commitment. It's heavy. There are sins to confess. I really need to straighten up, commit to walking a pure life, a clean life. I need to try my hardest not to fail or do the wrong thing. I thought I was a pretty good person. I hadn't done anything too bad. I had missed some church because I was tired or, and I hadn't, and I'd been rude to my sister and my family. But I was racking my brain trying to come up with the sins that I had committed so that I could ask for forgiveness. I knew God loved me, and my family had always told me that, but I had to confess my sins. Confusing for a young person who had grown up in the church and had tried hard to be a really nice person. What about the people who are making bricks in the hot temperatures in Asia? Do they need to confess their sadness from the hard day of hard labour? What sins did they commit in being born poor? What do they have to confess? I know some people feel like they did do things wrong and confessing their wrongs was refreshing and cleansing, but I was confused. I think I did it more to commit to God's way and it was beautiful to be included in the baptised community. And now I could attend Passover too. It was something very special. I give you a picture of my thoughts before baptism to see how far we have come. When I look back on it, it was confusing to me. It may not have been for you. When I look at this imagery of immerse, dip or die, I realise my baptism was powerful and is why I am here today. It's only taken me 20 years to see it. It's not a declaration of how committed we are to Christ. It is a declaration of how committed Christ is to us. We don't have to worry about whether we are ready. Christ is the one who is ready. I have been immersed in the relationship of communion. Forgiveness was already there before I even realised I needed it or asked for it. I am constantly being forgiven for my inad inadequacies and trying to do it on my own. And I have been given access to soak up the love, the joy, the peace, the patience, the perseverance that God has available to everyone. God has this wealth of love which softens, which strengthens, which builds up, which enables, which binds and welcomes. He brings that to us. He invites us in. It's a meeting point of us and God. We'll put up the next slide, please. Let's take a look at Jesus' baptism again. And remember, this is not something he does alone, but he does it with us. As he brings us into his baptism, we are included in his baptised life with the Father in the Spirit. First, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. Jesus' baptism is told by Matthew in such a way as to bring in some Old Testament stories loaded with theological content. The most obvious is the picture of creation given in Genesis. 
There we have the creation of the heavens and the earth, where the Spirit hovers over the waters and God speaks creation into existence. In the garden, we see God's presence with his creation. God never intended for heaven and earth to be a barrier between the creator and his creatures. In Jesus' baptism, we are seeing a restoration of this original intent. The heavens were open to him. In Jesus, heaven and earth will once again come together. In Jesus, we have the presence of God walking with us as he did in the garden. Second, we have a voice from heaven speak. This is the Father's voice speaking to his Son. This is the voice that spoke creation into existence and the voice we were created to hear. We may wonder what would God most want us to hear if he spoke to us? What words would he say? In this story, we have those words written for us. Since Jesus is baptised for our sakes, we can hear the Father's voice speaking not only to his Son, but also to us as adopted children. So what is it the Father is trying to say to you today? Seeing that this is the Creator, our Creator and God, we will do well to memorise and meditate on these words that he is saying to us in Jesus Christ. The first thing he says to each of us is, this is my child. How does it feel to belong? Is this not one of the deepest longings of our soul, to be claimed and wanted? How many young children's hearts are filled with joy simply by their parents saying, that's my boy, that's my girl. Not only is God telling us personally that we belong to him, but he says it out loud for all to hear. If anyone wants to tell you you are not good enough, that you don't fit in or don't belong, they will need to contend with this voice that thunders from heaven, claiming and naming us as his own child. When we listen to this voice, the sting of rejection is emptied of its poison. The second thing the Father says to us is, whom I love. Not only are we claimed and named by the Father, but this Father loves us. Let's face it, there are some people I'd rather not belong to because I know they do not care one bit about me. The blessing of belonging is found in the one to whom we belong. The Father is one who loves us. To fill that out, remember who the Father is speaking to. He is speaking to his own son, who he has lived, for all lived with for all eternity and loved. His love for his son is a perfect love, not a love that is self-seeking or filled with hidden agendas. He is saying to you and me that he loves us in the same way that he loves his own son. Let that sink in although it might take an eternity. The final thing the Father says to you and me today is, with him I am well pleased. It is one thing to belong. It is another thing to be loved. But what an awe-inspiring thing it is to belong and to be loved by one who also likes you, adores you, and favours you beyond belief. Can we really comprehend what it means to walk in the presence of God and by doing so, bring a smile to his face? It may be hard to believe the Father is really saying these words 
to us. But he said it to his own son, who is baptised into our lives in order to baptise us into his. When we realise that forgiveness precedes repentance or any other act of ours, our response to God of heartfelt gratitude makes us so very much more receptive to all he wants to give us. We can really soak it up when we are not obsessed by our own holiness. The invitation has always been there. The original intention was for God and man to dwell together. In our journey over the last 20 years to discover the heart of the Father, we have learnt that they come to us to open our eyes to what they are doing, to include us in what they are doing. Accepting this invitation to participation, immersion, soaking up their love is a beautiful way to consider baptism. That in this act, we leave our old self behind, our fears, our inadequacies, our wandering, and take on his resurrection and inclusion in community with the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit. Our response is an act of gratitude as the words ring in our ears. This is my Son, whom I love. With him I am well pleased.